morning. Good morning, John. Thank you for being here. And Thank, you for, me. Thank you for inviting me, Diego. No, 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 it's a pleasure for us. Um, this is our first of our new section on our website of uh, interviews which we're making to the people that visit us. And the idea is to have a talk around certain topics I, I selected. So my first question would be, uh, would be to ask you, it's not a question, but to, uh, to, to ask you about your, your family background, your, ah. where you were born, where you educated your parents, what did they, what did they do, stuff like that. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm from Glasgow in Scotland, and uh, uh, this is something that I share with many other philosophers at law. There's a, there's a long tradition of philosophical thought in Scotland. Uh, my parents um, uh, were not philosophers, though. They were both uh, people who worked in Germanic languages. And my father was a teacher at the university in Glasgow. Um, so uh, we had quite an intellectual environment in the house, but uh, I didn't learn any philosophy until I left home and went to college. Uh, I was a law student uh, in Oxford in the early 1980s, and I was the first one of the first generation of students taught by Nicola Lacey oh. when she was a young lecturer. And it was really Nicola who uh, made me interested in philosophy. And she sent me to uh, the wonderful Jonathan Glover for some tutorials in moral philosophy uh, to complement her legal philosophy teaching. And this is when I started to think that I wanted to study more philosophy. So your first influence is Nicola Lacey? Nicola Lacey, yes. And then what, what, uh, what other people were your most important influences? In? So I mentioned two, Nicola Lacey and Jonathan Glover, very important uh, influences on me. Uh, once I was a, a graduate student, I was fortunate enough to be able to work with some of the really very distinguished figures in our subject. Um, uh, as a master's student, I, I was taught by uh, Joseph Braz and uh, John Finnis, uh, a bit by Ronald Dworkin. I got to know Herbert Hart. Uh, I later, when I did my doctoral research, I uh, was closely with uh, mm -hmm. Tony Honoré and um, with uh, Derek Parfit as well. I had many philosophical friends by that time. So all of these people have influenced me in their different ways. And in your, maybe we, we could split uh, your just presidential work and your work on criminal law. Well, in, in each field, which were the people that influenced you the most? Uh, well, I don't think of my work as splitting up quite like that. Um, Do you think there's a continuity? Uh, I, yes, I just work on, uh, on uh, topics which appeal to me, and if I discover in my work that uh, I left some problem unsolved, I end up writing another paper to solve that problem, and eventually this turns sometimes into a line of work. And so people sometimes say, uh, you know, uh, Gardner, he's a theorist of criminal law, and I don't recognize myself that way. Uh, I happen to have written some articles on criminal law, but I always think it could have been anything. The philosophical tools and techniques are exactly the same. The influences are the same. Um, many people notice, uh, and they would be right to notice, uh, the extent to which my philosophical attitudes and um, uh, ambitions are influenced by, by Raz. That's not mm. surprising. He was my doctoral supervisor, my doctoral pater, as, as they say. And uh, I really uh, internalized a lot of the experience of talking to him. Uh, but I don't agree with him uh, all the time. Uh, I sort of share his worldview in the sense that I think that we should try and understand most problems that we encounter as philosophers of law, as problems of practical rationality, as belonging to the broader theory of the study of practical reason, which I regard as a fairly unified field. Uh, that's a Razian uh, doctrine that I've, uh, that I've learned. But if you want to know why, in particular, I started writing on topics in uh, legal doctrine, for example, yeah. criminal law and tort law and uh, public law in places, and sometimes about uh, anti-discrimination law and human rights law, why did I choose these topics uh, rather than just working like my predecessors in the Oxford School on the nature of law all the time? Well, the reason was that all my predecessors in the Oxford School worked on the nature of law so much that I felt that this is a saturated market. Uh, anything I say on that, those topics has been said many times before. Um, I, I could only really be uh, in the shadow of some great figures from the period immediately before me. 
And I think that for some of the people who were young um, professors in Oxford at the time when I was a student, this was a reason not to work in philosophy of law at all. Many people fled to other areas, uh, worked in socio-legal studies or became experts in particular theoretical approaches to law of a non-philosophical kind in order to avoid the shadow of uh, Raz and Finis and Dworkin and Hart, uh, which was a big and long shadow. Uh, but my reaction was different. I decided I would work on topics to begin with that were not the pet topics of any of these people. And in particular, I wanted to work on things that my supervisor didn't work on, you know? Some people want to work on things that the supervisor did work on, not me. I wanted to go off in a different direction. So I wrote my doctoral thesis on responsibility, which uh, wasn't something that Joseph Raz had written about at that time. It was written about a bit more recently. Uh, but at the time, that was a good way for me to learn philosophy of law with the, uh, one of the masters of the subject, but not always to live in his particular shadow. And then, well, once you learn how to do that with one topic, you learn how to do it with all topics. Mm -hmm. yeah. And funny, in the end, um, I ended up doing general jurisprudence work after all. I still tend to think that when I work on problems about the nature of law and legal reasoning and so on, I, I only ever really represent other people's solutions. But uh, I recently published a book of my work on this subject, and when I looked at it as a whole, I realized that it did have something distinctive about it, maybe just in the way that it orders the topics or understands how the problems are connected. So this is mostly of pedagogical value, I think. Yeah, and now you opened several subjects I would like to ask you. I'm one, so sorry. one was about the title of your new book. Uh -huh. this, uh, is law like a leap of faith, yes, right? Yes, that's right. Law as a leap of faith. Yes, so. just in a minute, we, yeah. I would like you to answer this too. But it's very interesting what you say about the legal theory or jurisprudence, if the question about the nature of law and, and approaching certain problems of legal theory on doctrine of law, like criminal law, punishment, or tort law, compensation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I agree with you. You have uh, the same the same philosophical approach, but the questions are different. And then you ask, you, you say, why didn't I focus on the first question? And I move to the second, because it's very difficult to say something new about yeah. the first question. Yes, and in a way, that's what happened with mature fields of knowledge. Yes. But before, before we started the, this interview, we were discussing about how law might be losing, philosophy of law, losing some place in the philosophy field in general. Well, what yes. What do you think um, about that? Are we losing some? I wanted to say, just before I answer that question directly, yeah. I wanted to say that I think that the great achievements in most fields of philosophy have been somewhat accidental. People didn't realize they were doing work as original as it turned out to be. Uh, I think that's true about Hart's book, The Concept of Law, and one of the reasons why it's a gigantic influence is because it's unselfconscious. Hart is not trying to teach us a whole bunch of new things. He imagines himself just to be gradually unrolling things that we already know and presenting them clearly. These were his ambitions. And look at that, how an accident can give rise to a real, a real classic. And so I always have uh, learned a lot from that and tried not to be a subconscious pioneer. Now our subject, this is a very good question, philosophy of law. Uh, has it lost its place in the canon of philosophy? Uh, maybe more than philosophy of physics has, or philosophy of history. I think these, uh, the differences of uh, disciplinary emphasis can be exaggerated. Uh, I was talking to the editor of a very prominent journal in um, our field in practical philosophy, who um, uh, told me that he hardly gets any submissions in philosophy of law, uh, very much to his regret. And I said, why is this to your regret? You have 10 times more submissions than you can handle anyway. <laughs> and he said, yes, but it would be nice if there was a bigger balance of topics. And he says, the philosophers of law, they have built for themselves a whole uh, operation uh, of uh, other specialist journals. And they are stealing the subject away from more generalist uh, journals. So this is an interesting perspective uh, on your question. I don't think it suggests a reluctance among philosophers to have us as their friends. 
I think on the contrary, the contrary just, we're, we are bound off to have our own special friends and it's not a good uh, thing for us to do. Um, but th there is something uh, here connected with the professionalization of the subject. Uh, many people working in philosophy of law are now uh, philosophically trained in a wider way. They understand philosophical problems. And this makes, means that intellectually they have more in common with the people who work in philosophy departments than in law schools. But it's almost always law schools who pay for them. Law schools uh, have been vested heavily in my lifetime, uh, certainly the law schools that I've worked in, in having a strong presence in philosophy of law. And law schools can afford to do this. Philosophy departments are always short of money. Hmm. So one of the reasons why this, you might say, ghettoization of our subject happens, and why we talk to each other, is because philosophy departments have realized that this is a way for them to get a special kind of external funding from the law school, uh, which uh, means they can spend their money on subjects well, that otherwise supplements. wouldn't be funded. I mean, which, which department in the university will fund more epistemologists? Uh, maybe information sciences in one or two places, but in general, the philosophy department has to pay for metaphysics, epistemology uh, for itself, whereas philosophy of law, uh, it can get the law school for free. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a free ride. Free ride. <laughs> I think that's part of the explanation, and it does have an undesirable effect of making philosophers of law talk mainly to other philosophers of law and less to general philosophers. But we're trained in many of these things, and I, personally, I teach in Oxford both in the law school and in the philosophy department, also in the new school of government. I mean, I mean I'm fortunate I get to move around and nobody asks uh, how many hours I do for whom. Um, so for me, I get the best of all these worlds and philosophy of law is taught in the philosophy department in Oxford. Uh, it's got its own place in their graduate program, uh, just as it has in our law school graduate program. And, and how is your approach in each, in each case? Uh, you approach a philosophy student the same way you approach a law student? Um, well, not exactly. I find philosophy students sometimes a little bit more frightening. Uh, but this is because of the tricks of the philosophy <laughs> trade, you know, the special way yeah, that yeah. a philosopher can trick you. That the mas magicians, like, the perceptual uh, magicians. Exactly. Yeah. We think <laughs> lawyers uh, are likely to use deceptive techniques, but philosophers <laughs> do it much worse. <laughs> um, but no, the real main difference I find between teaching in the philosophy department and uh, teaching the philosophy faculty and in the law faculty is that uh, the follow-up questions that I get from the philosophy students are naturally enough different. So one has to think about where the seminar will go in a way that uh, respects and reflects its connections with other parts of philosophical study. Whereas with the law students, of course, that's not the main interest. The main interest is in trying to see how legal examples would fit into mm -hmm. the analysis that's being presented. Uh, so it's not just philosophy of law that, uh, that I do this with. We have both, we have moral philosophy as well in both the philosophy mm -hmm. faculty and the law faculty, and I've taught both that course in both faculties as well. So this is not just philosophy of law, in moral philosophy also, the lawyers have their distinctive follow-up questions, and the philosophers have theirs. And do you find any different strategies, for example, regarding moral philosophy, you find, for example, that lawyers are more skeptical, or are philosophers more objective is trying to find something? I don't think that, I mean, there is some of that, I agree there's some of that. All lawyers have a tendency to be, um, I think, perhaps uh, uh, so wedded to the idea of uh, authority, hmm. searching for authority, that when a proposition has no authority, they think it can't be true. So that is a professional problem for lawyers. Uh, philosophers don't suffer from that because they think that reliance on authority is a famous fallacy. So they never make that move. Um, but uh, there's another difference which I think is more marked, which is that the, the law students are more naively optimistic about the extent to which moral philosophy might be a problem solver. They want it to be like law, and they want there to be concrete answers. Should the, should the Siamese twins be disconnected so that one of them dies? They think a moral philosopher ought to be somehow uh, a professional expert on this so that you can go and pay a fee to get the answer to that <laughs> in the way that you can get an answer from a lawyer to whether this is your house or his. Uh, and that's a great disappointment for my uh, moral philosophy students in the law faculty when they discover that moral philosophy creates problems that law is needed to solve precisely because it, no, is, morality this, doesn't have the resources to solve these problems it's itself. Yeah. It's yeah. a conception of moral philosophy as a religion. Right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, 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 that's, 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 that's some points and some Yes, exactly. Um, 
I think that's true. And the philosophers don't suffer from this because they are already used to the idea that philosophical problems are conducted at the level of abstraction mm -hmm. in which a great deal of indeterminacy prevails. This is the normal canon of philosophical work. They've all read a little bit of Wittgenstein. They all expect this. I think that uh, this is the main difference. And now we're talking about more philosophical religion and lips of faith. Ah, uh, yes. We'll come back. Well, you, you know, know why, why, why the title? Well, actually, when I first proposed the book to Austrian University Press, it wasn't called Law as a Leap of Faith, uh, Essays in the Philosophy of Law. It was called Law as a Leap of Faith and Other Essays in Philosophy of Law, because only the first chapter is about that topic. Uh, it's called Law as a Leap of Faith because it engages in some comparison and contrast of Kelsen and Kierkegaard. Uh, who are similarly troubled by their Kantian inheritance and fight all the time with the metaphysics of points of view, trying to understand how it would be possible to keep one's distance from the norms that one, that one uses. These are classic Kelsenian and Kierkegaardian problems. So in that first chapter, which I wrote oh, many years ago, it was the first thing I wrote in general jurisprudence, um, I was uh, interested in the, the analogies and differences between being a lawyer and being a priest, essentially. So I wrote about that, and then everything I wrote after this didn't refer back to it really very much. Um, and so the other chapters in the book don't really mention um, the religious or priestly hmm. paradigm again. But you could say that nevertheless the title captures something about the theme of the book. I mean, it's, uh, the book is persistently uh, juxtaposing law or a legal, a legal system, each legal system, with other kinds of nearby normative arrangements, uh, games, uh, the rules of associations, um, the rules of a religion, uh, morality. It has all of these things juxtaposed all the time. And uh, the, the, the question that maybe unifies it all is uh, uh, the question of these different normative points of view, to borrow the broadly Calcinian or Kierkegaardian expression, can be made to work with each other. Not in the sense of our deciding which one we should adopt, that's for another book, in the sense of understanding the logic of their relations. And I think that's really the, uh, the dominant theme. And so as I do that, obviously, I am constantly picking out the features that I think are distinctive of the legal and contrasting them similar but different features that are possessed by other normative arrangements or in other normative domains. So that's the way in which the first essay does set the tone for the rest of the book. But anybody who is in the business will tell you, I mean in the publishing business, will tell you that this is not important. That the title is, uh, the, the, the title doesn't have to tell you what's in the book. The title has to sell the book and then people who are interested <laughs> will read it and find out what's in it. So really, that's what you think of when you give a title to book, more than anything else. Um, and um, uh, going back to to your attention to <coughs> specific problems in legal theory, criminal law and tort law, I noticed that lately you're publishing more and more on tort law than you used to. I think that your concern with tort law was always there. Mm -hmm. You have published many years before mm -hmm. about the law, but let me publish a little more and a little less on criminal law. Yes. Well, this, this is just... Are you changing uh, things? No, this is, well, I, probably I am, but th th this is just um, my instinct to refuse any stereotype. So if somebody says somewhere, as they sometimes do, oh, Gardner, he's a criminal law theorist, then I have to immediately deny it and prove that I'm not by writing about something else. I never want it to be locked in by people's expectations. And so just about uh, five years ago, I, I decided that I had no really interesting new things that I wanted to contribute at the moment in the criminal law domain. Unfortunately, I had by this time developed a lot of expectations from colleagues who worked in that field that I would keep coming to their conferences and keep saying new things and keep trying new ideas. I didn't have any that I wanted to use. So I started to turn down the invitations to conferences and eventually I started to tell them not to invite me anymore. I didn't want to go to those conferences. I would love to see them at parties, but I don't particularly want to go and talk about criminal law for now. 
So leave me alone was my message. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm garboing. Uh, I want to be alone uh, because I would like to develop some new interests and interact with some new groups of people. And uh, yes, so I suppose I did think that the Tortlock group seemed like a likely group of people to spend some time with. Uh, and that's no offence to my beloved friends who are working criminal law, but please don't invite me to any more of your conferences. <laughs> no, it might be refreshing yes. to think about other fields. I mean, yes. and I think but do you think that there's a continuity in a sense, right? Yes. Because your concept of duty, reason behind yeah. duty, the continuity basis may be, I don't know, that we were discussing yesterday, does it apply, does it not apply to it? So, well, I, I, that different? I, I'm lucky, I have low philosophical expectations. Uh, I, I don't expect my work to add up to some great visionary uh, presentation of how the world should look when it's all put together. I, ha I have the limited ambition of saying things that are consistent so that, it, it, that we don't have to reach the sad conclusion that at least one of them is false. But if they're consistent, then I'm happy. So I don't really expect my philosophy of tort law and my philosophy of criminal law to be continuous in the strong sense of, in which some people expect there to be some carrying on of one theme in the next area. No, I expect to write about tort law in its own way and think about it as a tort lawyer might, but with some philosophical, uh, added philosophical features. And if at the end I have thoughts about criminal law and thoughts about tort law, tort law that are uh, not inconsistent, mm -hmm. then I can sleep happy in my bed. And regarding tort law, your main influences who would that be? Because there are two at least, as I see it, there are two very distinguished traditions. One is the hard time tradition that I think George Coleman has, in, in his best work, he has presented that vision. Yes. That's a, a conceptual explanation of tort law. And there is the Web Embrace Weber conception, that is a formalism, Kantian and Hegelian tradition. Yes. And what well, do you think about this? I, I, it's a methodolog I mean, methodological decision, methodological decision but not necessarily a substantive. Uh, that not that necessarily implies different. I, I don't know. You know, Diego, I don't. I don't. Um, I don't think about the world that I'm working in as divided up quite like this. Uh, I'm quite happy to find insights where I find them. I don't really engage in very much methodological reflection. I ask myself a question and see if it's the sort of question that my intellectual apparatus can tackle. Uh, if it can tackle it, then that's fine, and I don't ask, how did I tackle it? No. And so, I, I, I mean, I know that I'm no Kantian, but that's not because I don't find fa fabulous insights in Kant. It's just that I could never sign up to a philosophical approach in that holistic way. I would always want to see what was good and what was bad, uh, and I would always want to avoid getting carried away with a big enterprise. So what I said before about just looking for consistency is an explanation of also my methodological unselfconsciousness that I don't uh, that I don't have the higher hope of uh, having an overall philosophical uh, vision. So I think Weiner has done some great work. I think Coleman has done some great work. I think they've each made particular mistakes, uh, and I just am interested in uh, exposing the particular mistakes and seeing if I can build on the successful things they did to improve where they made mistakes. But I also feel equally warm towards the great works of, say, Posner, Calabresi, mm -hmm. um, uh, Goldberg and Zapersky, Ripstein, to name just some more recent people. I feel warm towards them, I think. Everybody does some great work, and I would like to find the uh, elements of truth in them and uh, you know, tidy up the mistakes a little bit, a little bit of Gardner Band-Aid on the errors in order to uh, see if we can just uh, are you push a little bit forward. The law and economics literature? Yes. Because I mean, in I a way I see parallel, I see, I, I work in a legal positivist group, so, but I always appreciated Dworkin's work. Yes. Because yeah. I, I, I think of it like a very good challenge. Yes. It, make, exactly. it makes positivists better exactly. after that. Oh, yes. Law and economics the same. Yeah. It made tort law so much better than yeah. it was, so yeah. much better because people just reacted against it yeah. and they produced wonderful theories. Exactly. If not, exactly. Well, that's my point. I agree completely. I also find uh, truth in all of these yeah, uh, they are, they are, of that I oppose. And uh, 
Um, I've always thought that I had the awkward position, at least it's awkward in the minds of many uh, students and colleagues, that I'm a legal positivist, but also a legal moralist, and also a legal instrumentalist. These are often thought of to be three ideologies. Uh, and you, if you're in one, you can't be in the others. But this is, when they're boiled down to their essentials, these are all valuable and in parts true ideologies. And it's always just a matter of finding the parts uh, and removing the exaggerations. And, and so that's all I do. I'm uh, chipping away at the, uh, at the call face of the, uh, of the subject rather than uh, planning the minds. We're running out of time, so I'm going to make you one last question, uh, and that will be about, about the future. What, what, other, what other subjects are you interested in for the future? Um, I, I have the misfortune that I'm interested in everything, and uh, I, I, I unfortunately, this means that my expenditure on books and journals is ridiculous, <laughs> because I'm interested in the philosophy of music and the philosophy of history, and I do a lot of reading outside the philosophy of law, so if I felt that I was competent, I would... I would love one day to be able to work in philosophical aesthetics. But let me tell you this, I, I'm never going to get there because I have so many more immediate things that I already know I have to work on in the meantime. So possibly when I'm in my 90s, like my good friend Tony Honore, I finally can turn my mind to, the, to the philosophical aesthetics. But for right now, I think I'm going to probably continue to uh, chip away at the call face of legal and moral topics. And uh, probably I have a long way to go with private law interests. I would like to do more work in uh, the theory of contract law and uh, the theory of unjust enrichment law once I've sort of, once I feel more comfortable with my general understanding of private law. And uh, meanwhile I have, uh, I, I also have interest in the philosophical foundations of public law. Public law. Yeah, constitutional law especially. So uh, I keep that ticking over as a teaching interest. Uh, and one day maybe I time to write more about that as well. In my recent book, I had a chapter on constitutional, constitutional arrangements about the difference between written and unwritten constitutions. Mm -hmm. And I think that showed me to my satisfaction that one day I could write more right, about that, that, those topics. Uh, but I always want to remember that I'm, I was trained first as a lawyer. I went to philosophy thanks to the excellent people who were philosophers in my law school, especially thanks to Joseph Raz, but also Tony Honoré and Nicola Leslie and others. And um, I, uh, so I owe a lot to the law. And I, I like my law students to uh, recognize a fellow lawyer, even in my philosophical work. So I've always made it an article of faith that when I write philosophical work, it will still speak to the, the lawyers. lawyers. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly cite a lot of cases. Or, I mean, <laughs> at one, one, one time I thought I could do that, but I just lose uh, my thread with case law very often, but I know enough law that I can uh, express my philosophical arguments in a way that I know will have a meaning for, for my lawyer colleagues. And I always think that was the biggest risk in the generation that came before mine, uh, at least in Oxford, uh, was that uh, there was a sense of growing remoteness and the philosophers of law, even though in the law faculty, were thought by their law colleagues to have lost their connection, connection with the law school. Yeah, because uh, yeah. everyone agrees that Ras work is an excellent work. Yes, yes. It's very difficult to understand. Very right? difficult. Very, yes, right. very abstract. Yeah, very yeah. difficult. I agree. And so when I got this job, which I think was a, a gamble by Oxford, and uh, I don't know if it will be a successful gamble, but, uh, but when I got this job, I understood the message. The message was Gardner, he speaks to lawyers, right? So he will take all this fancy stuff that wasn't written with the, with the legal right, readers in mind, and he will marshal it, organize it a bit, and then he'll come back to the seminars where the professor of private law and professor of criminal law are giving their classes, and he will uh, introduce these ideas in a more, um, a way that's more natural or more rehabilitated to legal life. And after all, that is where Hart came in. Hart was regarded at his time as a leader in the law school, although a philosopher and so a strange alien preacher, he was regarded as having as providing leadership in philosophical thought that the lawyers could do business with. And I think that that was a there was a risk in Oxford at least. I don't think this is the same problem or the same solution all over the world. But in my school, that was the problem. And 
for some reason, uh, probably because I still am deep down quite a liar, they thought I could play some part in the solution. So that's what I tried Actually, to do. Actually, going back to the beginnings, I remember reading once in your CV that you were a meter at the bar. Oh, yes. You practiced a lot? No, I never practiced. I never practiced. But you, why, why you wanted to be a meter? Because you, you have this interest, maybe? No, because I'm a coward. And um, I, uh, I was uh, about to launch myself into a career at the bar. Actually, this happened twice. I was about to launch myself into a career at the bar, and somebody called me up and said, but wouldn't you like to stay a bit longer as an academic? And I thought, easy, I can stay. I don't have to change my life. And so, so cowardly people often end up still working in universities years after they stop being students. And that's the explanation in my case. Uh, and uh, of course, it's a safe place also. If you're a coward, it's a relatively safe place to take risks. The stakes are low. You know, if I make a mistake in my philosophy, nobody dies. Nobody, nobody's impoverished. If I make a mistake at the bar, well, lots of bad consequences for real people. So, uh, if you make many mistakes, maybe the publisher will lose some money. Maybe, maybe, but it's, again, small stakes. They're going to lose 50 sales or something. I mean, you know, I, really, I think we should, I mean, you know, I don't think you should underestimate the role of cowardice in the same thing. It's a big responsibility to be a lawyer. Yes, I think it is. My, my, my wife does it, and I love doing it vicariously. I'm really glad I don't have to do it myself. Uh, it's very, very interesting work, but I have no responsibility. I don't have to worry about my actual clients. I never meet them. I just hear about them, and I'm given the opportunity to give abstract thought. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting compromise. Of course it is. Of course. Okay, John, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you, Diego. Thank you very much.